Dann begrüße ich Sie zum letzten Programmpunkt im Einsteinsaal des heutigen Abends, der Kunst und Leben gewidmet war und noch gewidmet ist. Und den Abschluss bildet eine ja, Diskussion verbunden mit einer Performance, die vorgetragen und die zunächst einmal besprochen wird, wenn man so will, von ähm, einem Konsortium, wenn das Frau Lepper ein passender Begriff ist. Mir gefällt ja immer der Begriff des Konsortiums, äh, äh, Agia, äh, das uns äh, Frau Verena Lepper, Ägyptologin am äh, Museum für Ägyptologie äh, in Berlin tätig, uns nun auch gleich vorstellen wird. Ich vermute auf Englisch, denn die ganze Veranstaltung wird auch in englischer Sprache durchgeführt. Und es schließt sich nach der Panel Discussion dann eine Performance, eine Darbietung an, in der nun diese, ja, wie könnte man sagen, akustischen Visionen einer künftigen Stadt hörbar und vielleicht auch sichtbar werden. Frau Lepper, Sie werden aber Ihrerseits die Teilnehmenden noch vorstellen und dann würde ich ohne weiteres das Wort an Sie übergeben und erinnere daran, dass wir auch alle vorherigen Sequenzen des Abends das Ganze filmisch aufgenommen wird und später auch auf dem Portal Lisa der Gerda Henkel Stiftung abrufbar ist. Willkommen Frau Lepper und willkommen Ihnen allen und ich übergebe Ihnen das Wort. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank für die einführenden Worte. Voices of Global Berlin, Big City Life. Sabahir, Achlan Sachlan, good evening and welcome. Esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends of Agia, dear Agia members and alumni, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the panel discussion and sound performance. Voices of Global Berlin. My name is Verena Lepper. I'm an Egyptologist based at the Egyptian Museum in Berlin and the principal investigator of AGIA. So what is AGIA? The Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And before starting with our panel discussion, I would like to briefly explain our mission and goals. AGIA is based here in Berlin, and we are quite proud of this, at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, BBAW, and at the same time at the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology, ASRT, in Egypt. We established AGIA in 2013 as the first bilateral young academy worldwide. And AGIA is 23 countries, one mission. AGIA connects excellent Arab and German scholars to face shared challenges and develop solutions through research cooperation. In Algeria, Bahrain, Comores, Djibouti, Egypt, Germany, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Tunisia, the United Arab Emirates and Yemen. The Arab German Young Academy brings together excellent Arab and German scholars to address shared challenges and develop solutions through research cooperation. AGIA has currently more than 60 members, in equal numbers Arab and German scholars, three to ten years after their PhD in any academic field. The membership is granted for five years, followed by a lifelong membership in the AGIA alumni network and family. Besides research cooperation, AGIA aims at capacity building and the promotion of young talents. And the Manifold projects, we roughly run around 80 projects each year, the Manifold projects deal with relevant topics such as scarcity of resources, public health, migration, education, or protection of cultural heritage. 
The Academy is active in science diplomacy and serves as a cultural think tank for the benefits of Germany and Arab societies by allowing a plurality of voices and interpretations and can productively clarify and mediate outside of the political arena. I have the great pleasure to introduce this evening the Agia Project's Global Berlin in the 21st Century. Global Berlin, this project was funded by the Senate of Berlin and was intended to provide a new interdisciplinary view of Berlin based on four examples from the area of health, humanities and social sciences, engineering and cultural studies. The projects were carried out by resident Agia members or alumni at renowned Berlin institutions and implemented together with alumni and members from the Arab world and other German institutions. The international perspective on Berlin helped here when considering the individual issues. At the Charité Berlin, for example, Ahmed Hegazi was researching together with Mohammed al Khatan from Kuwait on health and happiness, Arab-German perspectives on living environments in larger cities. In an interdisciplinary approach, the question of health and well-being in large cities was investigated in a research-based podcast series with international experts from an Arab-German perspective. There's a great deal of expertise within Agia, which was essential for this project, and in Arab-German dialogues, various cities were studied for their concepts and presented and moderated by Agia members, where several cities were presented in a scientifically sound manner and generally understandable for a broad audience. For example, from Berlin, Kuwait, Cairo, but also other cities. At the Humboldt University Berlin, Nahed Samur, together with Hanan Badrim from Egypt and now Salzburg, uh, worked on Arab perspectives on transformation in Berlin. In scientific discourses and intellectual discourses, German perspectives on the transformation in Arab countries are often taken and discussed. However, the Arab view of transformation processes in Germany is often left out. This research project aimed to fill this research gap using Berlin as an example and areas from philosophy, sociology, history, law, music, literature were included here. How are Berlin and its recent and past processes of change perceived in Arab research? As from Arab residents and fellow citizens in Berlin itself, which tectonic changes are having an effect far beyond the borders of Berlin? This is where Berlin can learn from our Arab partners. At the Rainer Lemoine Institute and the Technical University Berlin, Philipp Lechinger, together with Jamal Genouri from Algeria and now the UK, worked on urban smart mobility concepts in Berlin. Everyone is talking about smart mobility today, but what about urban mobility concepts for a city like Berlin? In a non-technical approach, intelligent mobility was considered holistically in, a re in this research project, and comparative case studies on different concepts were developed here. Based on an analysis matrix, cities were identified, mapping carried out, and assessment with the involvement of the local population. It is important to compare concepts with our partner countries and ultimately to develop guidelines in the form of fact-finding sheets in order to reach internationally um, scientists, politicians, local initiatives so that we can learn from each other after comparing them with concepts from the Arab world. At the Stiftung Preußer Kulturbesitz, I myself, together with Tarek Taufik from Egypt, we worked on Papyrus to Twitter, new forms of museum presentations in a digital age. This research project explored how new international presentation formats can be developed in museums today. Here, the special topic of literature was in the foreground. How does a museum present literature, analog or digital? What concepts are there internationally for this? What are the difficulties and challenges here? And which solutions are possible and developable, especially in the digital age? The results of various case studies are published as a scientific publication and a concept paper drawn up for future implementation. And on May 11th, we had a large Agia event, an evening event, presenting for several hours all these research results in the Humboldt Forum here in Berlin. 
And at today's panel, we would like to discuss some particular highlights. And we'd like to start with a sneak preview. Here we go. Happyopolis. This is a pro uh, one of the results of the project I mentioned at the Charité Berlin. And please listen. Happyopolis, a podcast about urban health and well-being in the Arab world and Germany. How can we make city life healthier, more social, and of course happier? Is there a scientific formula for a happy city? And can cities be compared, no matter on which continent you find yourself? In each episode of Happy Obelis, we'll be featuring cities across the Arab world and Germany, from Berlin and Munich to Cairo and Tunis. Why these cities? You'd be surprised just how many ideas for a happy and healthy city life they've developed. Solutions that are worth discovering and transferring to your own community. So join me on this podcast to hear members of the Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, Agya, and invited experts as they share their research and innovative solutions. I'm Dr. Louise Lambert, your host, and welcome to Happyopolis. Our first podcast in this series is about buzzing and busy Berlin and stress, the kind that comes from living in a dense and still growing city. Berlin has been shaped by its history, of course, but also by its long-standing residents as well as visitors. Today, Berlin is a global magnet for artists, scientists, as well as entrepreneurs. It is famous for its food from all over the world, alternative arts and music scene, diverse lifestyles, and let's not forget, it's a legendary nightlife. At the same time, it also offers natural oases, with more than 2,500 green spaces and parks, as well as hundreds of kilometers of cycling trails, allowing residents to get around peacefully. It is home to over 3.5 million people and is known for its welcoming nature and gruff charm. Yet, like many globalizing cities, it keeps changing. Rents are increasing, real estate is becoming more exclusive, and many residents are being displaced through gentrification. As more and more people call Berlin home, it is quite simply getting packed. More cars, traffic, crowded public transportation, as well as noise, garbage, and pollution. It's having an impact on public safety as well as the environment. Often called a permanent construction site, tensions sometimes rise. This brings new challenges for mental health, quality of life, and subjective well-being. In fact, evidence shows that social stress and other urban stressors lead to a higher risk of mental illness, like depression and anxiety, which raises several questions. Can we better protect the mental health and well-being of residents by minimizing stress factors? Well, Berlin has become a hotspot in the scientific study of urban stress and healthy cities. In fact, it's our topic today. Still, Life is life. This is the topic of this Salon Sophie Charlotte. And under this slogan, we would like to discuss today life in international megacities, with a focus on transformations here in Berlin. We just heard the sneak preview on health and happiness. We will discuss urban mobility and cultural education from an Arab-German perspective. So let me introduce our panelists of today. I would like to start with Agia alumni, Hanan Badre. She is the Chair for Public Spheres and Inequalities at the Department of Communication at the University of Salzburg. 
Hanan is one of the very first members of Agia and has thus contributed to the shaping of the, of the academy in a wonderful way. Since 2019, Hanan has joined the Agia Alumni Network, still with a very active role. And within the project's Global Berlin in the 21st century, her focus is on understanding and analyzing perspectives of Arab communities in and on Berlin. So my first question, dear Hanan, is, is Berlin the capital of the Arab exile? And what is your view of this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Verena, for uh, this very nice introduction. It's always my pleasure to um, visit uh, Agia and contribute to Agia um, events like the one today. Um, now back to your question, and um, if Berlin is um, a hub, um, a growing hub uh, for the Arab uh, intellectual community, the short answer is yes, but there's a, a longer explanation behind it because um, it needs uh, also to add nuances to what it means. Uh, in the last decade, we see and witness increasing numbers of Arabs that come and choose, actively choose to come to Berlin. And uh, I would dare to say that it has, um, have, uh, um, it ha it, uh, the reputation of Berlin increased that it would it, it compete with London or Paris, which were older hubs for uh, Arab uh, intellectual communities. Um, so it is indeed an emerging hub, emerging hub of uh, Arab intellectual life in Europe. Um, and we, we also noticed that beyond the first waves of the Arab um, uh, migrants and newcomers coming in the 70s and 80s, there is a new characteristics to the um, um, Arabs coming in the past decades. The, um, from blue color to white color, people who are active in culture, arts, um, education, and increasingly are visible in the uh, Berliner scenes, uh, co-shaping the cultural scene and uh, the music, the arts, as we will also witness later here today. So um, I think this is a qualitative turn. And that transformation even can um, be manifested in anecdotal uh, stories. You know, you, you go into um, an exhibition, for example, and you bump into the same people. People would say, oh, I'll, I'll go to Berlin to meet my friends I know from Damascus or I know from Cairo. And it, it, it seems almost ironical, but it has uh, become um, um, indeed, uh, or I hear it um, often from friends, oh, I came to Berlin and in one day I bumped into three people I know from Cairo. So uh, on that anecdotal level, it's true. And on the cultural level as well, you know, uh, Agia itself is involved in, uh, in, in many projects where I also happen to be um, co-working just here today in the Bibi Avi. For those who um, maybe have not had the luck to see the Paternoster exhibition, this is also shows how rich and manifest and, and, and manifold the manifestations of the uh, Arab community in Berlin is. I can add more, but you uh, you stop me when when you th see that the time is. Uh, um not on my side. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful start. Um, I would like to continue with my neighbor to the right. This is Agia member Philipp Blechinger. He is the head of the off-grid system research unit at the Rainer Lehmann Institute here in Berlin. He joined Agia in 2018 and is member in charge of the working group Energy, Water and Environment. Philip has realized several research projects on important topics such as climate change and climate justice. Currently, he's especially interested in innovative concepts for urban mobility. And my first question to you, dear Philip, would be, what can Berlin learn from Arab cities when it comes to sustainable mobility concepts? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Verena. Thanks for the kind introduction and for having me on this nice panel at the Salon. So, um, what can Berlin learn from other cities on sustainable urban mobility? The first question is, <clears throat> and you might remember when uh, the project was introduced, it was called Smart Sustainable Urban Mobility. Because in this discussion, it usually started with electric mobility, self-driving cars, 
um, digitalization of um, parking lots. So maybe you don't drive the car and it finds the parking lot for you. And this sounds like the, the future without congestion, without noise, without uh, these uh, dirty combustion engines. But it's only one pathway. And if we think beyond this technolo technological concepts, we see that there are very smart and environmental friendly and efficient concepts of mobility, which is, for example, walking. Yeah, you might have experienced this, uh, riding a bicycle or taking public transport. Most of the public transport is electric mobility already, so the subway, also trains run mostly on electricity. We forget this when we speak about the future of mobility. And before I answer what can Berlin learn and where we are, I want to give this to the audience. So my short survey here as a researcher is, what was your mode of transport to come to the Salon today or tonight? So first, we ask who was walking. It's interesting because you might live in the neighborhood, which is also an experience, or oh, your hotel is here. So who was just walking? So, so I would say like, it's like 7% when I calculate this. Then who was taking a bicycle? Okay. Then um, public transport. And then uh, who was driving with his or her own car? Nobody? No, no, I mean, it's... It's good. I mean, we check if you're drinking, right? But, and uh, who was coming, like, with taxi or Uber or... Well, that's... I mean, it's just... That's just amazing. We don't need to talk about cars here anymore. So it's only the question is how to make walking, taking a bicycle and public transport better. And this is where we look at other cities. And actually, the first example, and we learned in our workshop, it, was inspired by Bogota, I come back to Arab cities as well, but these are the pop-up bike lanes. And during the pandemic, it was all of a sudden, it was possible to create safe cycling infrastructure. And it was a, a big push. So if I quote our um, colleague, Professor Kreuzi correctly, he said like one kilometer of uh, safe bicycle infrastructure increases by 10 to 30 percent um, the amount of trips take, taken by a bicycle. So safe infrastructure is one thing and we can learn this at other cities uh, from other cities. The other thing is um, when we look at public transport, then we always, and I think this will discuss later on in a more detailed way, but public transport is also not only about affordability, but it's also about feeling secure. So I know most of you won't have an issue to come here with the U-Bahn or with the bus, but getting back one in the night, on a Saturday night, we have the football cup final tonight in the city. There might be some people which are a bit excited. And so, it, must not always feel very safe. So one very important issue, not only riding a bicycle is safety, also in the public transport. And this is where we can learn and where we can look what other cities do, other initiatives do. And I will take this in the later part of the discussion. But just again, I'm very amazed by this survey. So I, I take this back and say Salon Sophie Charlotte is like super advanced in sustainable mobility. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Philip. This is really an interesting insight of uh, this room and of the Salon Sophie Charlotte. And last, but not at all at least, I would like to welcome Agia co-president, Mahmoud Abdel Hafiz. He is Associate Professor of Physics at the University of Frankfurt and currently at Uppsala University in Sweden. Mega cities is our topic. He's born and raised in Cairo and lived in Frankfurt and Shanghai. So my question to you would be, how can, from your perspective, because this is your area of expertise, supermaterials help us to innovate mobility in urban contexts? Uh, thanks, Verena, for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. <laughs> 
So uh, 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 based on my research direction and uh, uh, my research focuses on studying new materials. And these new materials is toward these energy applications. And the, one of the properties of the material which I'm studying is a magnetic or superconducting material. So as you know, everyone knows about magnetic material and they, each, everyone has a lot of magnets around you. So uh, this kind of material can be used to innovate if, uh, mobility in urban context. And uh, uh, concerning the superconducting material, this class of materials that conduct electricity without no loss of energy. Because most of the current material which we are using now, there are a lot of loss of energy. So uh, uh, one example of this material is graphene. So if you have a pencil, and if you write with your pencil, you, you have a graphite. Graphite is a layered material. So graphene is just only one layer of graphite. So if you, do, if you cleave it by scotch tape, you can get this one layer easily. So this one layer can be conduct electricity without a no loss of energy. And it can be used for uh, uh, batteries with uh, different means of transportation. That means that we can also create lighter vehicles and also uh, uh, can be quicker charged and also give us a different uh, type of mobility in urban context. So, thanks. Thank you very much, dear uh, Mahmoud. Um, I would like to come back to Philip, and uh, you already raised sort of the different ways of public transport, etc. But my question would be why do you, we need new mobility that is gender sensitive, for example, within the public transport concept, for example, for women? Yeah. Um, so when we think about how mobility concepts are designed from the past, historically, men design these concepts based on ways men or men take. And this is usually the commute from home to work and back. So this is how the city transport systems are designed for commuting with your car. And these are usually like in, in stars, you see how to reach the city center and you have like highways and it works more or less well. But then you think of the person who has the obligations in the family of bringing the children to school or to the kita, then doing groceries, then going to um, not only groceries, I mean, there's, there's so many things to do during the day, like visiting a doctor, buying clothes, repairing the, the bicycle of your, of your younger one, and so on. And all these ways do not follow these usual routes, and they also take different modes of transport. And unfortunately, these ways are mostly done by females, because in still we have this unequal distribution of the care work, so the men go to work, they design the city for them, and the women have to deal with it and do like the unusual ways from the planner's perspective. But from the societal perspective, this should be the usual ways. This should be the ways you should think about. And here we should start thinking about new concepts, making cities more equal, making mobility in cities more equal. One way is, for example, um, creating what is called Keats blocks. This is like low traffic neighborhoods where you have most of your like daily, um, daily businesses you can do within your neighborhood. Whereas low traffic, you can do this easily by walking, by having a, a cargo bike yeah, and feel safe riding this bicycle or you have some ways of uh, public transport. So this is one concept or one, 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 one huge mistake we should, we should correct is the the goal of planning mobility should not be um, how to get to work and back home, but it's about all the other ways. And another example is this public transport. And in our workshop, we, we learned from, from Arab cities that uh, which had a, like more challenges in like um, for for the female part of the society to move like around to move in public transport, and that um, it's not only about the, um, 
like the train or the bus itself, but it's also uh, to look at the stations. So the last mile, like the way from home to the station or arriving at the station, think about these stations, make them safe, make, put in street lights, maybe some surveillance, so that it's that you don't need the Uber from like the metro station home. Yeah. So also you, this way should be safe. And um, another thing where we can uh, learn culturally from each other is that in some countries, riding a bicycle is very uh, also a male thing. And I think in Berlin that's fine. We we don't have this, but we should reflect this when. Um, having this in international exchange on uh, proposing like, yeah, just ride a bicycle, it's not that easy. And we, we found initiatives in Cairo who, uh, who, uh, which offer trainings for girls to ride bicycles and, and break this, this um, cultural habit that only male, um, that only men would, would ride a bicycle. So these are some perspectives from, yeah, some gender perspectives on mobility planning and I'm by far, far away from being an expert on this, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just these, these ideas need to be researched and they especially need to be trans, transported to the policy makers that there's a real uh, change is needed here. And, and very briefly I want to thank you for your work because even I said electric mobility is um, not the, the only solution, it's part of the solution, especially electrifying public transport. Um, we do research on like fast charging stations for, for public buses. At each stop they have like one minute and we need your materials to do this in a very efficient way so it's, it's really connected. Um, material research and, and planning of transport systems. So thanks for your work. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. And I would like to take up and uh, continue to question uh, Mahmoud. I mean, when we look at these kind of lighter vehicles, looking at meta materials and superconducting materials, what can be used to make vehicles um, lighter and in order to, you know, have a better future for our urban mobility? So, concerning the superconducting uh, material, uh, as I mentioned, that superconductivity means that there is no resistance. And uh, what has been using now for the electricity uh, to transfer electricity is a current material used is copper. And the copper is not perfect conductors because with time you see there is a loss of energy. Although we pay this energy, but uh, that's uh, the current material. So if we find a material that has no loss of energy, which we call it superconductivity, that will be a breakthrough. The many challenges with this material that it does not work at room temperature. So we need to cool this material down using liquid, hyd liquid hydrogen or liquid nitrogen. Uh, 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 that costed also money and uh, co costed also a lot of time to cool down and so on. So our research is trying to push the, uh, uh, the, this material to be working at uh, room uh, temperature. So once we have this kind of materials, we can use it for uh, uh, batteries which can may be made f with these uh, lighter vehicles and also can be charged quickly and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Coming from the urban mobility, back to you, dear Hanan. In the framework of the Agia project, Global Berlin in the 21st century, you co-edited a book on Arab Berlin. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this book project. Um, thank you, Verena. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, it's my pleasure. Um, we have noticed that in literature there's a huge gap when we um, Google Arab and Berlin. It's either Arab clans or Arab food, like uh, looking for a restaurant. So we've decided that we need a book, uh, we need scholarship that uh, centers Arabs as Asians, as um, uh, objects and subjects who view Berlin and describe it through their eyes, but also together, and, and here I uh, highlight the Arab hyphen German, in the uh, Agia, the Arab German, we also have German perspectives reflecting uh, um, on Berlin and that um, perspective from outside Berlin and also from inside Berlin on this transformation from um, 
um, connected to the um, rising hub um, or emerging um, hub that we um, that I've described earlier. So. Um, we, we look at this in the book, which, by the way, is already um, uh, running and the manuscript will be published in September by Transcript Verlag. You will also have flyer at the exit after the event where you can pick it up. It's called Arab Berlin, co-edited by myself and Nahid Samur from Humboldt uh, University. Um, we have different clusters on education, culture, but also arts. Um, culinary arts, uh, museums, um, um, scholarly and cultural life, how do exchange students perceive uh, Berlin, for example? How do scholars uh, after COVID-19 perceive Berlin? We have uh, an Agia member writing how uh, Berlin became a little bit gloomy. She came in the phase where we're, we're neither open nor entirely closed in Berlin. So what, does, uh, what did the pandemic do to the city? You know, uh, For example, this is just uh, like a, a teaser so that you would also uh, look into the book later on. Um, we have um, co curators from the um, Arab Film Festival writing a chapter. Um, a mix of Agia and non-Agia members speak together um, in this book and cover a wide range of disciplines, gender studies, demographics and migration, media and culture, society and history, political science, and so on. So um, we're very happy that it also brings different disciplines together, brings different perspectives together, and the voices, you know, in the title of the event here, I think also comes through in the book very much. And thanks also for Agia, of course, and the Berlin Senate for making this happen. Thank you very much. You briefly mentioned also museums here in Berlin and I would like to briefly expand on uh, some of the results of the project from Papyrus to Twitter. What we could work out and find out about new concepts of museum exhibitions and cultural education. We, for example, looked at more than 100 collections and exhibitions who have a particular focus on issues like literature or the so-called flachware, so papyri or manuscripts or books. And this is not easy. This is not easy to display and to make it exciting. So we looked at these 100 uh, collections and came up with um, uh, some interesting um, results also combined with a survey that we did among the Agia community. What do you expect from a museum, from a special exhibition? How can you best talk as a, muse a museum curator to the public? And it was very interesting that we worked out that both digital and hybrid formats were on the fore, and a lot of discussions and suggestions were given there, but also traditional formats. And I think the combination of all three in this period of transition phase that the museum world is in right now, internationally. So we looked at Alexandria, we looked at Sharjah, we looked at the Louvre Abu Dhabi, really looked sort of all over the Arab world. So what we can learn from exhibitions and museum concepts um, internationally. And we came up with a exhibition concept um, that we hope to realize indeed here in Berlin in 2024 on the museum island about diversity in the ancient world. And diversity is a topic that is very dear to Agia. So all the Agia members will be included in this project. So a diversity of concepts, a diversity of members will be sort of involved in this and I would like to take this opportunity of course to invite all of you to this inshallah wonderful exhibition in 2024 where we in this year celebrate 10 years of Agia here in Berlin but of course well beyond as well in the Arab world. Voices of global Berlin we heard from different perspectives today and in Berlin, numerous Arab and German Agia members and alumni work at a variety of research institutions and universities. Not only is there a great deal of expertise, as we heard here as kind of sneak previews in so this very short period of time, in half an hour, but not only this great deal of expertise is here, but Berlin also plays a central role as a location for science and innovation in a global context. And the interdisciplinary view of the city of knowledge from an Arab-German perspective has provided the latest findings that provide 
impulses to make Berlin, hopefully, an even more livable city with a model character. With the support, with the kind support of the Berlin Senate, Agia was not only able to implement these important research projects, but also able to expand the existing cooperation between Berlin institutions, but also internationally. Life is life, still life is life. Life in cities has been our topic in the past Salon du Fischerlotte, where we presented a listening station with sounds of city life from Beirut, Cairo, Kuwait City, and Berlin. And we would like to extend the exploration of soundscapes with today's performance to future or on future city life. But before I hand over to Amin Falala, I would like to thank all panelists, Hanan Badr, Philipp Blechinger, and Mahmoud Abdelafiz for their wonderful contributions, and I would like to thank the magicians behind the scene, the team of Agia, the team of the Agia office here in Berlin who made this possible, and in particular, of course, I would like to thank Sabine Dortmüller, and uh, with a large team um, of wonderful colleagues, it's a pleasure to work with all of you here in Berlin, and particularly in the Salon Sophie Charlotte. Now, Join us and listen to the composition of sound artist Amin Falala and Tobias Hagelstein from Berlin. How does the future sound? Especially audible in cities of its technology and mobility. The sound of movement is dominant and characteristic of each and every cityscape in Berlin as well as in Cairo, but all over the world. One of the fundamental changes in our acoustic environment is caused by transformation of combustion engines to e-mobility. The sound installation by Amin Falaha and Tobias Hagelstein makes the process of technological innovation audible in an interactive sound and music collage. So who are these two gentlemen? Amin Falaha, media manager and DJ, was born in Frankfurt and moved to Berlin seven years ago. And since 15 years, he contributes to the cultural scene of cities worldwide with events, performances, and installations. And Tobias Hagelstein is a sound engineer and music producer from Berlin. Together, they founded the label Duat Records. The two artists developed collaboratively the sound performance Future Sounds of mega cities for this special event. Thank you very much for doing this. And Amin will be on stage for you tonight. And we kindly ask you to be a little bit patient until everything is set up for this wonderful performance. And with this, I'd like to thank you all and please enjoy the show. Shukran and thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.